I have been in the industry for about five years now, and um, there is a huge steep learning curve going into this industry. And I'm just trying to help make it a little easier for anyone who's trying to get into the industry themselves to get through all those hurdles that there are um, to make it as smooth a process for you moving forward as I can. Um, so last week um, we started uh, the course and we started with uh, part one which was concept prototype, prototype taking an idea and making your first prototype. Um, so we were last week focus was on a lot of raw information. Um, so it was getting the raw information out to you for um, the basics that you need to be able to even just start making your game in the first place. So um, all the individual bits that you need to even get moving forward to begin with. Uh, so we're going in a slightly different direction with this week's. This week's part two, uh, game design on a budget, rapid iteration. Uh, so this is all about uh, making the changes to your design as quickly as possible. Um, sometimes, if needed, in the middle of a playtest. Um, if there's something so completely broken about the, uh, the game that you're working on, you need to fix it immediately to be able to move forward. So how to be able to do that on the fly, how to do it super quickly in between playtests, because um, the quicker you can be iterating your game design, the quicker you're going to get to more play tests and the more feedback you're going to be getting. So along with that is actually going to be a whole thing on how to actually interpret the feedback that you're getting back from these play tests. And uh, um, some of the key things that you need to keep in mind with the feedback that you're getting. Um, we're also going to be going over uh, free software that's available to you to be able to use to make your prototypes um, that are very helpful for making things quickly. Uh, again, just as a quick reminder, next week we're going over making professional quality prototypes and talking with artists. And the final week we're doing uh, self-publishing or working with a publisher, uh, the different facts that you need to know for considering both ways. So before we go any further, last week we had a homework assignment. That homework assignment was um, to, uh, I'm just bringing up the paper here, uh, the homework design challenge here. Oh, sorry, that's completely the wrong sheet. Um, let me go into the right sheet then. The uh, design idea worksheet. That's the correct one. Uh, so the design idea worksheet, it, uh, the whole idea of it is to help you to begin getting working. So it's uh, figuring out what your initial idea is, uh, your theme, your objective, all of that different things using the initial stepping points that you were working on last week. Going from here, it'll be a whole lot easier you moving forward to use this as your basis from which to be able to expand upon your design and iterate on your design. So if you uh, did the homework from last week, you'll already know the kinds of pieces that you're going to need. Um, so these are the pieces that you're going to need to make as your physical prototype to be able to rapidly change through. So this gives you your initial list of what you're going to be making um, when you're going through all the different software uh, ideas that I've presented or will be presenting for you today. So this is your initial basis to be able to expand upon and to help you plan out your next steps. So when we get to uh, the point of prototyping and uh, making the design pieces and that. I'm going to open the floor up and uh, give people a chance to talk about uh, some of the ideas that they have and the pieces that they're going to need for those so that we can discuss uh, different ways that those prototypes can actually be made based on what ideas people have actually come up with.
so the setup. So when you're setting up your first prototype on the computer, and I do actually recommend doing it on the computer because it will be a lot quicker for you in the end. Um, so go with what you're used to. You're not trying to go and learn whole new programs, whole new software. Um, you're not trying to uh, learn the best stuff you're trying to start with whatever you know at this point in time. That's going to help you get developing quicker. And the biggest thing with development is you want to be developing. So get yourself going with it. Don't take a long time to stop, pause, learn something new, and then continue with your development. You're going to be quicker and more comfortable in development if you start initially with software you already know. So while programs like InDesign and Corel are absolutely great for making a finished product and are things that I would uh, say are almost needed to make your finished product, you're not making a finished product, so don't even consider them at this stage. Um, in fact, when you get to the point of making a finished product, there are potentially other options out there available already. So in design, Corel, unless it's something that you use all the time already and you're already used to, don't even consider them. Take them completely off the list. Good programs that you can start with if uh, you don't have any particular program you're used to doing any sort of quick design stuff for already would be uh, open office um, open office draw specifically um, it's a free program uh, the link is there on the um, on the page and it's also on the download that was uh, given for today um, microsoft publisher if you already have the microsoft office and you're used to doing it um, those are perfect programs for doing your initial designs. And there's a lot of different things you can actually do in those designs, in uh, those programs. Um, you can make cards using Nandex. So this, this is the kind of thing where you will need to actually learn the software. I guarantee that almost none of you have attempted to even try this software before if you've even heard of it. Um, the reason this is useful is for people who are um, designing all their cards in a spreadsheet layout already, Nandact actually will be able to read that spreadsheet and turn all of them into cards for you. So instead of needing to uh, make each individual card in a program like uh, Open Office and Publisher or anything like that, um, Nandec will be able to take all that information and make your entire deck of cards. So some examples. These are all used uh, with um, Publisher, um, but Open Office Draw will come out looking pretty much exactly the same. So these are actually uh, carrot card size um, that are properly measured out on a sheet. And one of the advantages that I like with, um, with Open Office Draw and with Publisher is the fact that if I have symbols that I'm going to be using throughout a design or key elements that I'm going to be constantly reusing throughout a design, I can just have them off to the side and can just draw them on as needed and they'll be available on every single page for me. Um, but because they're actually off the page layout itself, uh, they won't print when I go to print it. Um, so it makes it super simple to be able to make uh, make designs quickly and as long as I have the uh, the sizing of something already done all I do is copy the page and it sets everything up for me already smaller um, smaller size cards you can do exactly the same thing so you just set up your template first uh, set one sheet up as your template and just copy that page every time you're doing things. So this is really good for if you're needing even like a uh, hundred or less cards in your deck 
it's or it, for your game, it's useful to just set up in a template like this and do it um, because it's going to take you less time than learning the software of NAND deck and then implementing that. If you're doing a, a game such as a deck builder or an, uh, a, a game that is very, very card heavy, uh, 200 plus cards, um, then I would recommend taking the time to actually learn NAND deck. Um, tiles. So uh, this is an example of tiles that I set up with the cut lines already. Um, very, very simple. Uh, these I just printed out on cardstock and they were perfect for being able to play test with at that point, thick enough to be able to shuffle everything that was needed. Um, and oddly shaped tiles you can easily do in uh, in Publisher and Draw as well. So it's very easy to make oddly shaped game components that you're going to need uh, because all the tools are already there and easily accessible to be able to just quickly whip these together. So those are the basics of, uh, of Microsoft uh, Publisher and of OpenOffice Draw. Um, they're very, very quick for that iteration. Um, where they start slowing you down is um, if you're having too much going on on each sheet at a time. So for instance, let's say you have um, a uh, deck of almost 100 cards that you're dealing with and you need to make changes to almost every single one of those it's going to slow you down at that point to be able to go through and make all of those changes. So that's where it starts slowing you down in the, uh, in the iteration. But um, you also have the option of just copying out the specific cards you need if you're only doing a few changes. You can copy those specific cards to a whole new page, make those changes, print it, and you're good to go on your next iteration. Um, so iterating itself, your design is something, but you think it's something else. Does anybody know what you think your design is? Oh, and I have a message here. Um, Nandek is actually really easy to learn. Um, I, I have actually spent time working on Nandek. It did take me a bit to figure it out, but um, for the basic stuff, it's not too bad. If you're trying to do more in-depth things with it, then yeah, it, it's definitely going to be a lot. Um, so for this, your design is something, but you think it's something else. Your design is garbage. It is bad, um, but it doesn't really matter how bad you think it is. You think it's better than it really is. And that's because you're invested in it. And that's good. That's good to be invested in it. That means that you want this to be successful. But what you need to realize is that in the early stages, it is not good no matter how well you think it plays at that point. So to make it great, it has to go through many changes. Um, many, 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 many changes. Um, as a perfect example, um, I have on my desk actually above me in my shelves, um, my uh, shelves on my desk are jam-packed full of different iterations of games I'm working on. I have one particular game I'm working on. It has, it's on its 18th iteration. And in this case, it's like a full complete reprint of the game. So you're going to go through many changes to be able to make a good game. And you need to accept that early on. So the quicker you're going to be able to make those changes, the better your design's going to get. 
So it, iteration comes down to being able to make those needed changes that you have to do as quickly as possible. So tools everybody needs. A ruler, I would actually say a metal ruler. This is because you're going to be doing a lot of cutting. So you want to try and make those uh, edges as straight as possible, especially when you're getting into more of the stranger uh, design shapes, such as uh, for tiles, hexes, different things like that. And of course, you're going to need a cutting mat to cut this on if you're doing all this. Otherwise, you're going to be dolling your blades very, very, very quickly. Now the interesting thing is um, the cutting mat and uh, cutting blades, and I do actually recommend a rotary cutter uh, because it will make smoother cuts for you. Um, the cutting blades and uh, cutting mats, you'll actually find these the cheapest usually at sewing stores. So go down to uh, a sewing store, go onto a sewing, uh, sewing hobby website, and that's where you're actually going to find the best prices for these because they're needed for sewing all the time. Um, metal rulers, uh, go to any stationery store and pick up a metal ruler. Uh, that's actually where they're going to be cheapest. Other things that are really helpful is a straight edge blade. Um, there are going to be times when a rotary cutter is not going to be able to do the cuts you need. Uh, so you need a secondary blade just in case. But keep in mind that a straight edge blade will dull faster than a rotary. So keep a, a good amount of spare blades on. Here. A corner cutter is not needed. I've seen many, many people go out and buy these and say that they're working on them for their prototypes. Um, because they're trying to make the, uh, the best looking prototypes they can. Don't waste your time and money on this. Card sleeves. These will save you so much time. The reason being that if you have a whole pile of cards or even just a few cards, um, you use your card sleeves, you can switch things out very, very quickly, and your deck is still uniform. So you don't have to be as precise as with your cuts. You can be a lot quicker with your cuts, um, which will get you to uh, your prototyping quicker. Um, you can also uh, cut things smaller than the sleeve if you grab cards. So cards are uh, really great to grab from the dollar store, combine it with your sleeves. Now you have backs for your decks as well. Um, I actually, uh, I go down to my local dollar store, buy three different backs of uh, cards, and that way I have three different deck types that I can readily make for games. Um, so those will be the backs that people see when playtesting, really doesn't matter. Because all I do is I uh, print what I'm doing to paper and slip it in in front. Um, and then all the, the uh, I can have extra of these uh, just cut out even, be able to write changes on um, if a prototype is uh, testing badly. And I can change it mid-test if need be because of these blanks that I have. It's such a rapid change but you've gotten the information that you need to be able to progress on further. Um, so yes, this allows you quick switching between playtests or even during a playtest. Tiles. A lot of games require game tiles. So um, No Escape here, which was one of my uh, earlier games, is a uh, perfect example of tile layouts. Uh, again, super simple to do. Uh, you just print it onto cardstock instead of onto uh, paper. It gives you the thickness you need to be able to play test with. Uh, if you need to be able to shuffle them or anything like that, it'll have enough thickness to work with. Um, 
it's not always the easiest. Cardstock sticks together when you're trying to shuffle it, but it'll work well enough for prototyping and playtesting. Um, again, have blanks cut out of these. So have extra ones cut out, ready to switch out if need be. Um, when you're doing play tests, really what you want to be doing is focusing on having um, multiple play tests going all at once. So you don't want to have to cancel your entire play test time because you found such a major error in something that you have to go back to your computer and, and correct it. So have the material you need to be able to quickly switch something out and write what's needed on it available at your play test. Other random game pieces. Um, these can be uh, from coming from other games, uh, things you've grabbed from dollar store bits around your house. Um, again, at this point, it doesn't really matter as much for these other pieces. Um, the other pieces are often not going to be changed overly much during your play tests. It's your printed components that are generally going to be the items that need to be changed out the most from play test to play test. So these don't actually matter that much to what they are, as long as people can recognize them for what they're supposed to be in the game. So don't spend a huge amount of time finding the absolute best pieces that you need um, that's time that you can instead spend on testing and iterating your game. So, where are you going to test? Um, we talked about the uh, first bit last week, which is friends and family. So these are great for your initial tests, but you have to keep in mind that people filter their feedback, even unintentionally, they're going to filter their feedback. And it's rare that a friend or family member will tell you if a design is just plain bad. So it's not always going to be the most useful feedback in the end, and they may not even know how to give you feedback. Game meetups. Sometimes you'll find people at game meetups who are not interested in playing prototypes. They only want to play finished, nice looking games. And you have to accept that. But usually at game meetups, you will find at least enough people to be able to put together a small enough playtesting audience initially to take it to your next step. Um, keep in mind, though, that at game meetups, because these are people usually used to playing finished products, they're often going to be more critical of how the game looks in its current state. So you need to be able to filter through that feedback, which we'll be getting to in a bit. Um, they have quite a bit less of a filter on their feedback, which is good. You want, them, you want people who can take that filter off they usually don't know you, or if they do know you, they don't know you as well usually. So they'll be more uh, willing usually to be completely brutally honest. And brutal honesty can actually be very, very useful at this point in time. Because if you're consistently hearing that this is not a good game, then that's something that you need to be listening to. And you need to then think of why it's not. That doesn't mean the game itself needs to be gotten rid of, but maybe there's a critical point within the design that you need to look carefully at and either change or remove from the game completely. And sorry, I have something that just popped up and didn't register. There we go. Okay, so other designers, these are going to be some of the uh, most useful bits of feedback you can get because these are people who have been in the stage you're in. Obviously not with the same design, uh, but they've been in the same spot you're in. So they know what the struggles are at that stage. So they'll be able to look at your design and 
look at the stage you're at and give you feedback useful to that stage. So if you can meet up with other designers, this is going to be the absolute most useful. Testing in isolation obviously creates an issue for this. Um, and this is part of the reason why uh, the, um, the Facebook group has been created for everyone. And that's so that uh, everyone has other designers that they can contact who are at the same stages as them, um, where you can talk to other people about the issues you're having, about uh, problems you're having, and uh, being able to set up playtesting as well. And the best way for playtesting in isolation is going to be set up a print and play of some sort. So set up your files that you would print out yourself and arrange with someone who's willing to print them out and test them for you. Um, so this is going to be a, a great way to provide feedback to each other on different uh, areas that you're with and be able to continue your testing process as quickly as you can. Because isolation is going to greatly slow down um, your iterating ability. Okay, so feedback. Before we get into feedback, I'm going to pause here. And I'm going to uh, bring up the um, homework here again from last week. Do we have anyone who uh, would like to share the idea that they have and what pieces they feel they would need for that? And we can, uh, we can then try and discuss as a group how those pieces can be most easily made. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, so the game that I'm uh, designing right now, uh, it takes uh, place in the apocalyptic uh, setting. Um, uh, basically, uh, two generations after the proliferation of um, not like the nuclear war, and as you can imagine, like everyone is like starting to like uh, for, not forget uh, their vocabulary, uh, like not forget their uh, language. Not uh, like after after some years of not uh, like having kids as as well, and so the judges that have like retained the knowledge of of the languages that before are actually inventing their own language now. So now I have a cards and I have a six of dry erase boards uh, and I have uh, markers. In which uh, what you're going to do is uh, you're going to put syllables together and uh, you're actually going to create a word that most likely doesn't exist in any other language, basically. And then you're going to define it you know, like a based on uh, different scoring styles uh, that the, each player is allowed to, uh, to pick. Um, so there's drafting um, and uh, there's about 104 cards. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, but, uh, I guess the main thing that would be, uh, how would you uh, handle, uh, the dry erase words? Uh, because I've been looking uh, kind of like all over, um, for the dry erase board. Now. So dry erase boards, um, how I would handle those as a uh, prototype piece is um, lamination sheets. Um, so you can, uh, you can buy a pack of lamination sheets and cut them up. Um, or even uh, you could use, instead of lamination sheets, you could even use um, sleeve protectors. Um, and, uh, or sorry, uh, not sleeve protectors, um, page protectors. A uh, pack of paid protectors you can pick up fairly cheaply. And um, just slide a blank piece of paper into it, and there's your whiteboard laid out for you already. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, any other piece concerns that uh, you had in your design? Oh, um, 
Uh, not that I could uh, think of an offhand, uh, no, but like I just uh, had an issue um, with just like a finding uh, like the dry erase board because um, no, like a couple of uh, my games I was not working on, I was not like creating them initially from a uh, game crafter. Um, and like they didn't have like any markers or like dry erase boards. Um, so. No. Yeah, the, those are those are definitely more of a specialized component. So don't don't go for the full component off the bat. You know what the end component for your design, what you want it to be. Uh, so now you're going to pull back and simplify it for something that'll work for um, being able to quickly make changes uh, and being able to put it together super cheaply. Uh, but yeah, really, uh, that's all I I had with that. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, cards and dry erase markers, um, such as uh, silver and gold, write and roll. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. I don't know that game myself. Um, yeah, it seems like the same kind of components. Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, it's like a card that you can use your dry erase markers to like fill out and you, they, cl they clean off pretty easily, but you kind of like fill out your own sort of player board, but it's all oh, just okay. like regular cards. I don't know how they got it with a finish that would be dry erase. But oh, okay. That, yeah, that's, that's a special finish that goes on at the manufacturer. Um, so if, if you're wanting something like that and you're wanting something card-sized specifically that you can use for dry erase, uh, then just use card sleeves uh, with, um, with a sheet of paper in it. And yeah, that's the thing. Um, I mean, like it would have to be you know, like a little bigger uh, than you know, like just a card. Like, not by I mean the dry erase card would be uh, definitely good implication. Um, uh, basically, like the object of the game is you know, like to write you know, like the best definition, like while scoring, um, you know, like within that style that you chose. So this is a uh, pack of 66 inch by 91 inch card sleeves. These are uh, larger card sleeves that hmm, my camera keeps sinking its background uh, that we uh, use in uh, some of our prototyping. Um, so card sleeves do not need to just be your standard size card. Um, there's lots of different sizes of cards in games. Um, so you can find a larger size card sleeve and you'd be able to use that. Awesome. Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else have, uh, have um, questions regarding their pieces that they'd like to go over for their designs? Okay, so we're going to move on then. Um, so just going back to uh, the slideshow here. Um, so feedback. Uh, so this is really how to interpret your feedback is really what this section is all apart, all about for us. Um, so what really does the feedback mean? Um, so feedback is not always verbal. And so this is one of the things that can be really hard with being in isolation to be able to, uh, to pick up on uh, because you're not going to necessarily be watching people as they try the game out. So if people are specific, are, are if people are continually doing specific actions wrong or if they are continually missing them, um, this itself is a bit of feedback. So players 
could be expecting things to be done a certain way. And the reason they would be expecting it to be done a certain way is because other games do it that way. If there's a standard way of doing thing, things in other games already, um, and you're trying to do something similar, try to set up your rules and mechanics so that it does it the same way as other games. Once people have learned how to do something a certain way, it's harder for them to learn to do something similar a different way. And this is actually going to be a sticking point for people as they're going through designs. This is actually one of the biggest sticking points for people when they go through their through uh, playtesting people's designs is they hear a rule, they understand it to be similar to something they've played in another game already. And so they will try and perform that rule in the way that they understand it from other games. This is actually part of the reason why there is so much sharing in a lot of game designs, is because it follows the way people learn. A lot of games actually start out going in completely divergent directions than other games, but they come back together and start sharing uh, the uh, ways rules are written or the ways actions are performed because that's how people are already expecting them to be. And so uh, remove the obstacle of learning the game um, by simply changing it to be in line with what people are already expecting. Jonathan, yep. I uh, played a game last night for the first time and we got uh, a little confusion over scoring because we would trigger a scoring opportunity with a yellow token and then automatically use the yellow scoring marker. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, that, that's part of what I'm talking about. So using the same thing in multiple ways when normally you use an object for scoring in one way. Um, that's, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about because that's adding a new level into existing rules. Um, so people would commonly expect that for uh, scoring a game, you have a marker that you're scoring with, and then if there's additional points, you're either adding it up with a different marker or adding it up in a different way. A perfect example of this would be Terraforming Mars, where you have your score track, which goes all the way around the board. During the game, everyone can see the main score that people are currently at. At the end of the game, when you're adding in your final score counts, what you're doing is you're just moving up this marker on the track. So you're not adding in a whole bunch of extra things. You're not having to move things to other parts of the board. It's all done on the same track. Um, so moving back to uh, specific actions being either continually missed or done wrong, there might be too much going on in your game at that point. So you could have so many different things that people need to keep track of that the reason they constantly miss things is because there's too much for them to remember. Um, so this, this comes back to trying to simplify the design. Um, and the design itself may just simply be awkward. So the reason it's being done wrong is because people can't understand the way it needs to be done right. It's just too awkward still at that point, and you just need to refine it still. So this particular element, you need to change it. No matter what the reason is that people are missing it or doing it wrong, you need to change it because they're going to continue missing it or doing it wrong. And when I'm meaning that they're continually missing it, I'm meaning you do 10 play tests. For nine of those play tests, all, the majority of the people playing it miss this particular action or do it wrong. That's enough data to go off of to tell you that there's something wrong with that. So can, you need to consider changing that element. And if you've gone through and changed that particular game element many, many times, 
and it's still either being continually missed or done wrong, is it even important for your game? Obviously, people are still playing the game. If they're still getting all the way to the end, you need to just consider removing that game element completely. How do I do blank? You're going to hear this a lot. And in the beginning, that's perfectly fine. However, when you start getting into a point where it's a group of play testers who have played it a couple times, uh, three, four times, and they're still continually asking how they do something, um, there's something wrong with that. It's either that the rules themselves are not very clear, they're not explaining it enough, or again, there might be too many options. There's too much going on for them to understand what they need to do at this point in the game. So again, for the first few turns, and often for shorter games, for the entire first, sometimes the entire second play test, you're going to hear it quite a bit. But for longer games where um, actions are performed on a regular basis, people uh, have the same options to them open all the time, um, or games that you're getting, shorter games where you're getting into your third, fourth play test, and people are still asking how they do something. Um, then you know that there's an issue at that point. So you need to check your rules and find out from your players what those rules actually mean. You can read them, you understand them, you know what they mean, but ask your players what they mean. Ask your players what the rule actually, how they understand it when they're reading through it, when they're trying to do it. Um, what is it to them? Is there a common term that is used in other games that you're not using in your rule? Use that term. So for instance, you have a deck of cards that people draw from to be able to start their turn. That's your draw deck. So many games already use the term draw deck that unless you have a very specific thematic reason for needing to change that term, don't. Use terminology that people are already used to. Um, what's your elevator pitch for the game? So um, I don't know if anyone is currently uh, participating in the uh, board game design lab um, game design contest that they're running right now. Uh, but one of the uh, things that they have in there is uh, asking you what your hook is. And so this is your elevator pitch. Um, your hook, your elevator pitch, the whole idea of it is you're getting people interested in the game. So what language are you using in your hook or in your elevator pitch that actually makes people interested in the game and makes them want to play it? Are you carrying that same language through in the explanation? Or do you switch to completely technical dry terms? Technical dry terms are boring and you lose people with them. So if you got people excited using specific kinds of language, try and explain it using similar kinds of language and people will learn the game a lot better. The game takes too long. You can get this feedback even on a short game. You're not gonna get this feedback only on longer games. Um, games themselves, it doesn't matter the length of the game there's going to be reasons why people enjoy the game, no matter the length. So if people are saying the game takes too long, what are they really saying? The game isn't fun. It felt like work. 
No one wants to leave work for the day, pull out a board game, and do more work. This is their time to relax. So what does it mean when they're saying it feels like work? You see that uh, a couple of the people playing the game aren't even focusing on it. They're doing their own side conversation um, that has absolutely nothing to do with the game, nothing to do with anything related to this. That itself is actually feedback. They're telling you something with that. Players looking at their phones constantly, picking up their phones, doing something, responding. Again, not uh, engaged in the test, engaged in the feedback, this, or engaged in the play test. This is feedback. Players leaning back away from the table, leaning over, looking disinterested. Again, they're not saying anything, but this is feedback. So the players are bored. They are bored with the game. Um, so you need to figure out exactly at which point in the game they got bored. When did they lose interest in the game? When did they start finding it boring? Um, what actions were they doing? What actions were they unable to do? How long were their turns taking? Um, were their turns taking a very short time or a very long time? Was everyone else's turns taking a very short time or very long time? Did they have anything that uh, interacted with the game that they could do during that point, or was were they literally just sitting and waiting? All of this will tell you at what point you're losing your players. So analyze based on not only what the players are starting to say, but the actions the players are doing to be able to tell at what point in your design you need to be focusing more on. The game takes too long. So again, um, this was on the last uh, page, but it applies again in a different way. So this is again, going back to paying attention to what's going on at the time. The game was really slow. Sometimes games that are over in 10 minutes, the players are still going to tell you it felt slow. So you need to really look at that. I lost track of what was happening. Or someone who's playing it for the very, very first time in the first few turns, um, that's not uncommon. But if they're later into the game, later into your play test, um, they've gone through a few turns successfully, um, and they're telling you that they've lost track of what's happening, then there's an issue that you need to look at at that point. Players keep asking what they can do. They, they can't remember what they're able to do. Again, they're picking up and looking at their phones, leaning back away from the table. Uh, there's too much downtime going on. So between each player's turn, by the time it gets back to them, too much time has passed for them to feel engaged. So you need to look at how long is each player's turn playing? How many players were playing? Um, is the game actually optimized for that many players? Um, did each player have too many different options that they could take? And so they spent too long planning out what they were going to do each turn, even if the actual actions themselves took a very short period of time. Um, are the actions overly complicated? So doing this leads into doing this, that leads into doing this. But if I do this, I'll lead into doing this, leading. If you have too many chains that are building up, um, the downtime between each person's turn is going to build up. Um, so you need to keep in mind that um, in the early prototyping, the games have a lot of complexity, and this is, this is very uh, key for the games that have a lot of complexity. The more complexity you add on, um, the harder it's going to be to keep your playtesters engaged. So you need to find ways to look at, at what specific points in your design, um, when they're playtesting, they have lost the engagement. 
Maybe you can simplify certain actions. You, maybe you can remove certain actions during playtesting. Keep in mind that for complicated games, you don't need to test the entire game in a setting. You can actually limit what players are allowed to do during your playtests. So if the game actually does require a lot of complexity, limit what players can do during the playtest so that there's not too much downtime, so that they can continue playing the game. If they continue playing the game, and the further they get on the game, the better feedback you get from that playtest. Even if it means that you've only tested certain aspects of the game in the end. I couldn't do too much during my turns. I didn't have a lot of options. I didn't have a lot of choice. Um, I had to do this specific action every turn. I was only able to do blank. My, de my decisions were scripted. There was only one option. So all of these are very, very similar. The game was too fast. It's not fun. Or it's really slow. Seems kind of a odd and opposing because sometimes you'll hear from people in the exact same playtest even that the game was too fast or the game was too slow. You should add blank into the game. There's not enough options for the players during their turns. Um, perhaps they're feeling like they have to do a specific option because realistically it's the only option that will actually bring them anywhere. Um, as a uh, perfect example of this, um, one uh, play, uh, uh, one uh, game designer I was talking to a, a few months ago, he was talking about the fact that in this one game that he's working on, um, he can't seem to keep people engaged past the first three turns. And I asked him, well, what are the first three turns like? And he's like, well, you need to collect the resources you need to do stuff during the rest of the game. And like, so for the first three turns, everyone's collecting resources and only collecting resources and not actually doing what the game is about. So remove those three terms. Start the game at a different point where the game's not scripted, where people don't have to do specific things and you'll actually keep the engagement of players. Um, are they doing the exact same or very similar actions every turn? Um, it might be that from what they've seen and what you've explained of the game, um, the other actions and other options aren't going to help them as much as these. So this can be a balance issue. It could be that uh, your players have realized what the optimal strategy is for your game already, and that's what they're taking. So look at what the other options you have available for them are. Are they actually viable options at this point in the design? If they're not viable options, maybe you need to change them to make some viable options. It could be that there's actually no, uh, no options for players to do during their turn, and they must do a specific thing. If this happens once in a while during a game, such as um, games based on card movement mechanics, where you play out uh, your hand of cards to be able to move or take actions. And then once you've played them all out, or once you play a specific card, then you can pick them all back up. That then is a, uh, a scripted action for the players that they have to take once in a while. So as long as it's something that's only once in a while, that's fine within the mechanics. But if it starts being that it's the majority of the gameplay, then the players are not going to be engaged with that game. I think blank should look like blank. That's great. 
that's good feedback because they're actually giving you what they feel they'd be engaged with in a physical look. You're not at that stage though. So note it down. Don't have the, don't let it have any impact on your design at this stage. But note it down for later because when you're getting to the uh, next stage in your design, um, when your design is working fully properly and people can play it from start to finish without any errors going on, um, when people are saying they're having fun with it, that's when you can start looking at prettying up your design, having something look a specific way. And that'll be useful feedback for that point. But you're not there yet. So note it down and then move on. You should use blank component. Again, this is, this is great, but you're not at that point. So note it down and move on. This isn't really my style of game. No game is everyone's style of game. So you're going to find a lot of people who will play test your game. Um, they might even after just the first one or two turns just tell you, I don't like these style of games. And that's fine. Not every single game is going to appeal to everybody. Um, you will have just as many people talking about how great a game is as you have people who say, I don't like that game. And that's perfectly fine. So don't, uh, don't think that there's something wrong with that. Um, that is actually good feedback because that actually gives you information for, again, later stages, which is who is your audience. So applying feedback, um, a common designer mistake, don't take the feedback personally. This is not a personal attack. They're not criticizing you. No matter how attached you are to this design, no matter how much um, this particular design means to you, the game is not you. So don't take it personally. They're criticizing the game and they're trying to help you improve the game, even if they're doing it in not a very nice way. It's not a personal attack on you. So do not take it personally. Um, don't let one person's opinion affect your entire design. You will run into playtesting groups where there is one loud, outspoken person who gets their point across louder than anybody else, who uh, speaks over everyone else, who is more insistent than anyone else that what they are saying is most important. They are still only one person. So even if they are part of one of your main playtesting groups, you need to keep in mind that they are only one person, no matter how loud and outspoken they are. So you're looking for trends among all your players, not just the loudest one. Don't change too much at a time. So what, what are some of the biggest dangers that uh, you can run into if you change too much in your design at once. Does anyone? It becomes a different game? It becomes a different game, exactly, that's the thing. You're now testing a completely different game. If you're testing a different game, you're not at the sta same stage and same level of testing that you were at, you're back at the beginning. So if you change too many things at once or make too big of changes to the design between tests, you no longer know um, if what you're working on is actually the same thing anymore. Yes, uh, that's also another perfect piece of feedback that we put in the chat. You don't know what the problem was or what the fix was. So yeah, um, if you make too big a change, there's a good chance that you didn't actually really know what the actual problem is. 
you realize that there's an issue with this, but that might not be the full issue. That might not actually be where in the end the issue actually is. People might be getting stuck on this because they were stuck on this before. So you need to make incremental changes to your design so that you can test at each change where the problem actually was. Cut the fat. The design is your baby. This is something that you are putting your heart into. This is something you care about. But just because you care about it doesn't mean it's any good. So you need to really ask yourself, are you keeping ideas, themes, mechanics, anything like that in the game because you like it? Or are you keeping it in because the game actually works better with it? Sometimes your favorite game element in the game, you need to remove because it makes the game worse. Um, Jamie Stegmaier actually uh, did an entire interview on that exact point uh, for when he was designing his game Tapestry. He had a particular element in the game that he thought was going to be um, the perfect design element for that style of game, and he really enjoyed it. But the more testing that happened, the more he realized that that was actually slowing down the game and making it harder for other people to really understand the game. And so in the end, even though he said he really liked the design element and he wants to find a way to use it again in the future in something else, it didn't fit with tapestry, and so he had to remove it. And so that's the kind of thing that you need to look at yourself. Why do you have design elements in there? Are they actually there because they help the game, or are they there because you like them? Um, a little, uh, a little thing that we have here is, uh, going through your entire production, uh, the entire production element. So once you have your concept up at the top on the screen here, you're going into your prototype. You're playtesting your prototype, applying the feedback, reworking your prototype, going back into playtesting. And this is a continual cycle for you. This is something that you're going to be in for quite a while. This is not something that you can quickly move through. Because this is your time to be able to make the game amazing. So you don't focus on anything other than the mechanics, the, uh, the game flow, um, the rules, all of that, that is really what your focus on the game is. What the game looks like is making sure it's playable at a minimum level. Nothing beyond that. Because you want to be able to make those changes as quickly as possible. And if you start putting in design elements, such as art, at this stage, you might then find out that that art doesn't even work for the final game. So don't waste your time on it. Make the game as quickly as possible. So again, uh, a little bit bigger here. So go back to your design files. So once you have enough feedback, um, where you know specifically things that need to be changed. Um, I'll actually get to that one in a sec. I'll read that out and get to that in a sec for everyone. Um, so once you have enough feedback, uh, enough changes that need to be done, um, go back to your original design files, change what's needed, do it again. Um, often you're not going to be doing this every single time. Uh, one of the Greatest things about uh, when you're using cards and card sleeves is you have a small little change on a card that needs to be done. Cross off what's written and write the new stuff in. Makes it really quick and easy for you to keep going, keep going, keep going. 
So once you have enough changes that actually need to be put through, um, or it's getting too hard to read stuff, um, go back to your design files, make the changes, print it out, do it again. And again, and again, and again. If you get to the point where um, you're starting to find that people are not understanding things as easily because there's too much wording going on, and you think it can start being symbolized by symbols and people are going to understand it better with symbols, start using some. Gameicons.net is an amazing place to go for free symbols. Um, these are free to use symbols. Um, you can even use them in final game designs as long as you give credit to the designers. Um, they're adding more symbols to the library all the time. So currently they have a little over 3,800 symbols in the library. And you can search by specific tags. You can type in the search that you want. Um, you can download it in different formats. You can even do some uh, quick changes to it on here before you download it, if you need it. Uh, so this is, uh, once you've gotten through enough, uh, um, enough changes that you know a specific element is going to be in the game, you reuse it a lot, and you want to simplify it down to a symbol, start throwing a symbol in to make it easier for you. Um, it was brought out here that uh, the noun project um, does the same thing. And yes, uh, the noun project is actually really good in that respect as well. Um, I will just bring it up here for everyone. So again, it's uh, free uh, icons that you can use. Um, this one actually has more icons in it. The reason I actually recommend um, game icons first is because these are going to be icons from game icons that when people see them, they're going to have a bit more of an attachment to what that means in relation to a game. Um, so because all of these are specific for games, um, people may be able to use these easier to be able to understand what a concept is. Um, but yes, the noun project is also incredibly good at grabbing those free symbols that you need if you have something that is not here already. So if you're getting to a point where you absolutely feel art is needed, and the only reason I would ever say to even start putting art in in any way, is if you have a design where art will actually help with the explanation for people. Um, as a perfect example for this, uh, there's one game that I was making where as part of the game, um, people were exploring levels in something. Um, and uh, originally when I was uh, doing it, it was all out on cards. Um, you'd put the cards out in a particular way to show you were going up the levels. But seeing the cards, uh, people weren't really understanding still in the end what those cards really related to. So I found some free art I could use uh, that would show actually going up a tower. Um, in the end, the game even wasn't specifically about a tower, but it helped represent what was needed, so that each time a card was laid out in, on a certain part of another card, it made it look like you were building a tower up. And this helped people understand exactly what was happening, on, happening in the game. So if you're going to use free art, use uh, Creative Commons, or CC, um, Level zero or level three is some of the best ones to use. Creative Commons art um, are things that are free uh, to use. Um, Creative Commons zero is free to use without, um, without crediting the source. Uh, Creative Commons three is free to use as long as the source is credited. 
Um, Creative Commons uh, 1 and 2, um, they're still free to use, but they have a bit more legalities involved in using them, and often it's better just to avoid them for a different thing. You can actually find art by simply going to a Google search, typing in the kind of thing you're looking for, and then adding CC3 onto it. Again, do not use your final art at this stage um, because your game is still being changed many, many, many times. Uh, create your basic design mockups in Canva. So this is something that Canva, again, is something you can use to help design the game elements. It is also a free online tool. And as an example, here is a card that I threw together in just a few minutes. Um, so it has all the basic information I need. Um, looks like something that uh, I even put more effort in than I really did. Um, this can get people a bit more engaged in it. So this is something where, again, if you're playing with groups that are having too much trouble getting past the way the design looks to give you proper feedback. Um, whip something quickly together. Don't spend a lot of time on it, but whip something quickly together so that people can get a better idea of what you're trying to do. So again, there's the card itself that I just did up. Now, uh, the question that I had from earlier, um, how far from the original idea do you go before you decide the game is no good? It seems one could slowly end up switching to designing a totally different game. That is actually true. Um, so as you're making changes, you need to really weigh are you making this change because it's going to improve the game or do you need to change um, how people understand this which comes down to rules and explanation so before you make a full change is it something that actually needs to be changed to be able to play the game or is it something that you need to change how you're explaining it for people to understand how to play the game but again if you've made several changes made several changes your design is getting further and further and further away from what it was ask yourself are people enjoying it if people are still enjoying it and it just doesn't seem to be quite where it needs to be continue making it um if you're making change after change after change after change after change um, and people still aren't really enjoying it, shelve it. This doesn't mean get rid of it. This doesn't mean stop it completely, but put it aside. Sometimes what you just need is to work on something else for you to understand what wasn't working in your other design. So we only have a few minutes left. Um, which is perfect because we're right at the end of the uh, presentation. So before um, I open it up for Q&A though, there is one, uh, one file uh, that was sent out to everyone, which is the um, fail faster, uh, the um, playtest uh, pages from fail faster. Uh, so again, um, I uh, would like to thank uh, Jake Cormier for giving me permission to be able to use this. Um, and this is a good, uh, good starting point for you guys to be able to use, um, to be able to get proper feedback from people. So ask people the questions that are here as your initial basis. You're likely going to need to expand the questions that are here. But these will give you a starting point. Um, you're going to need to expand it based on the specific design you're using. 
um, specific game you're trying to make. But this is a good starting point for you to begin getting the feedback with. Um, at this point, um, next week, we're going into making professional quality prototypes and talking with artists. Uh, so I'd like to open up the floor at this point for any questions that anyone has. Yes, How do you uh, take into account cost when you're coming up with your game design? Because like, I have this idea, but then I'm trying to think about components and trying to minimize the amount of components that might be necessary. Um, at this point in your design, don't be worrying too much about it. Um, right now, you're trying to make something that works and something that people have fun with. Once you get to the point where people are having fun with it and the entire design works, then you start analyzing the components that you have in your game and seeing, is there a way that you can combine um, some of the components together to be used in multiple ways? Is there um, certain components that realistically don't actually need to be in there and that if you do it in a slightly different way, you can remove them completely? Uh, so start looking at what is actually in your game and how it's used, and then you can start seeing if there's things that can be removed from the design at that point. Awesome. Another question we have here, do you suggest only testing with one's target audience or a more broad range of playtesters? Broad range. Um, because the reality is what you believe your target audience to be may not actually be your target audience. And so do it with a broader range um, than where you think uh, your audience is going to be appealing to, because you may actually surprise yourself about who the game actually appeals to in the end. Thank you for both of those questions. Do we have any more? Oh, yeah. Um, yes, so in the Facebook group, um, yes, definitely, if anyone wants to uh, jump on, get together with things, things like that, please uh, get together with each other and arrange it in there. That is the perfect uh, way to be able to meet up with each other and test your designs with each other. Mm. Uh, another question here. I keep trying to add art to my game early on because my theme is comedic and without the art it seems to be lacking. So um, the biggest thing at this point is try and when you're doing a play test, um, ask your players whether or not they're really getting it and try and figure out where you may be losing your players with. Um, if you're going through and there's things that they're just not getting, things that, um, things that just aren't working um, because of the particular style you're working on, and you really feel in the end that art would solve this, um, again, go the free solutions. You're not looking for the exact thing in your game right now. Um, you're looking for a best fit. Um, so try and find a best fit it uh, to be able to test with at this point. Do you think it's it's a more important to uh, streamline your game or is it more important to uh, make those uh, interesting decisions in your game uh, so that you uh, keep your audience attentive? I guess like that's now, what I kind of like get paralyzed in my design is not like sometimes I want to I want to put so much into the game, now, but then I worry that like not enough people are going to not like catch on to it initially. Um, so that's like kind of like my fear that I'm going to like make it like too complicated that no one's going to want to learn. But at the same time, I want to be able to apply interesting decisions like a multiple like play styles like not just one linear play style so this is the kind of thing where um when you have a lot that you want to put into a game you need to be able to figure out uh what's the minimum 
you can put into the game first for the game to be playable. Um, then ask yourself, is the game fun at that point? Um, and test it at the minimum playable level. Are other people finding it fun? Um, and you keep adding elements on until uh, people are fully engaged with it and uh, people are enjoying what's going on. Don't add everything in at once. Uh, start with as little as you can and start expanding out from there. Um, that way you'll be, able to, uh, you'll be able to find your minimum viable product. Your minimum viable product is what you in the end want to be uh, bringing to people and want to be testing with. You can add more items on later once you know your minimum viable product works. But if you don't even know your minimum viable product works, you'll have no way of knowing if all this works. Um, another question here, do you know what templates did you use in Canva to make those cards? I'm just searching for it now and I can't find it. I did not use a template. I did that one completely from scratch. Um, so I, uh, I made a custom size uh, of just a standard playing card size um, and just dragged all the items in. Um, as, uh, as the card itself said, it took less than five minutes to make that. Um, so just play around with it. It's, there's a lot you can actually do with it. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question, if there's any more questions that people have. No? Okay. Oh, oh what is the title of the Facebook board game group? Um, it, uh, it is, again... Um, it is a BGDL online. Um, I will put the link in the chat window for everyone here. Uh, can we post our game ideas and get feedback in the Facebook group? Yes, that is uh, pretty much exactly what the group is for. <laughs> um, the group is to help you guys in being able to uh, further your designs. And I believe that is all the time we have. Um, so I am actually going to give you guys all a little bit of homework for next time. So your homework for next time, based on the um, information in today's part of the course, um, I want you guys to uh, put together a uh, prototype, print it out and cut it out. And then once you've done that, take a picture of it. Show that you have done this by commemorate, commemorating it in a picture on your phone forever. You don't necessarily need to show us this. If you want to it, feel free to post it into the Facebook group. But this is to get you guys further ahead, to get you to the point of being ready to be rapidly iterating your game. So take the uh, homework that you did from last week and turn that into your first prototype for next week. On that note, guys, thank you very much for uh, joining today's session. And I hope it was helpful to all of you. Uh, and keep designing your games. Um, the only way that you're going to get better and that we're going to get more games is if people keep designing. So great job for going this far, and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. <laughs>